Picture this. You're in a coffee shop, you're waiting in line to get your coffee, and you hear someone calling your name. So you turn and look, and someone's coming towards you, and they're super excited, like, oh my gosh, it's been so long, what have you been up to, how have you been doing, we really need to catch up sometime. And meanwhile, you're just standing there, wondering, where in the world are you supposed to remember this person from? If this has ever happened to you, like it's happened to me, this is a great example of just how important the ability to recognize another individual is, even just in our day-to-day -day lives. It's also a great reminder of what happens when you don't recognize another individual. So now that you've got your coffee, you're walking down the street and you hear some chirping in the bushes. You turn and look and there's a whole flock of sparrows just sitting in the bushes there. Some of them are chirping, some of them are singing, and others are chasing each other around. Now, as a kid, and even now as an adult, I've always been fascinated by the animal kingdom. And one of the things that you start to notice when you spend a whole lot of time looking at birds on bird feeders is that there's a whole web of really complex social activity going on. Some birds will let others sit next to them, some will chase the other others away, and there's just a lot going on. And one of the questions that I had was always, how do the birds know who they're supposed to be chasing away from the feeder or who they're allowing to sit next to them? And this question is something that informs my current PhD research. Hi, I'm Isabella. I'm in the integrated program in neuroscience at McGill University. And my guiding research question is, how does individual recognition work in your brain? In particular, I'm interested in the neural circuits that let you take sensory information, such as someone calling your name or a specific pattern of feathers, and turn that into the recognition of an individual. To study this, I use zebra finches as a model animal. And zebra finches are a gregarious songbird species, and in the wild, they live in flocks of up to hundreds of individuals. Additionally, zebra finches mate for life. And this means that they have to be really good at picking out one specific individual from the crowd again and again. So they have a really robust system of recognizing other individuals. And this is something that makes them really good for my type of research. Additionally, zebra finches have a couple of other uh, unique traits. So this here is a picture of a pair of zebra finches. They are sitting really close together in this behavior called clumping. It's kind of the equivalent of a human cuddle, and it's something that they do with a mated pair. And right away, you can see that there's some very distinctive visual cues here. So the male on the left has these bright orange cheek patches. He also has these nice zebra stripes on his chest. And these are both visual cues that he can use to signal his identity. Additionally, zebra finches are songbirds, which means that they also have song. And the song sounds something like this. And we know that song is also used by zebra finches to identify other individuals because female zebra finches consistently prefer to hear their mate's song over a stranger's. So the way that you would test this is you build a really long cage and you have a speaker on either end. And one speaker is going to be playing the mate's song and another speaker is going to be playing a random bird song, so an unfamiliar song. And then you put the female bird in the center and you let her choose where she wants to spend the most amount of time. You can think of this in human terms as if you're in a club and each floor of the club is playing a different style of music. You're going to spend the most time on the floor that's playing the kind of music that you like. And this is exactly what we see with the finches. So if you look at the mean percentage of time spent on one side or the other, you see that overwhelmingly, the zebra finches choose to spend time listening to their mate's song. Additionally, zebra finches also have some other unique attributes. So when the males are learning to sing, they are learning to sing based on being taught from an older male. And if there's no older males present, then the juveniles never quite figure out how to sing properly. Now this is for males and for females, they don't really sing at all. However, we do find that female finches who are raised without song actually have an impaired ability to discriminate between frequencies. So you can think of this as they can't quite tell the difference between an A and an A sharp, for example. Now in one study, what the authors did was they trained zebra finches to break a beam in response, an infrared beam in response to some frequencies and to not break the infrared beam in response to other frequencies. 
And then they tested female finches who were raised with song and raised without song. So the finches who were raised with song learned this task really well, and they were able to do this after a couple of days of training at about 90% accuracy all of the time. However, female zebra finches who were raised without song never learned the task quite as well, and they weren't able to do it with the same level of accuracy. And this kind of impairment also carries over to more ethologically relevant aspects of zebra finch life. So zebra finch males can sing two kinds of song, and one is a very high quality courtship song, and this is meant to impress females and show them what a great guy the male is, and it's really intended to court and woo the females. So if we look on this graph where a one is a preference for a courtship song and a zero is a preference for a different song and 0.5 is about a chance level, so no preference at all, what we see is that normally reared females really prefer the courtship song. And this makes sense. Again, the males are using this courtship song to attract females and show them that they're great. So it makes sense, evolutionarily speaking, that normally reared females who are raised in the same conditions as they would be in the wild really prefer this really attractive song. However, what we see with song naive females, so the females who are raised without song, is that they are hovering around the chance line, so they don't have a strong preference either way. And this is very atypical for a species who, again, use song as a method of courtship. What is really interesting about this, however, is that song naive females still form preferences for their mate's song. So previously, I talked to you about how zebra finch females prefer to hear their mate's song, and that was with females who were raised normally, so they were raised with exposure to song. But what we find is that these song naive females, the ones who are raised without exposure to song, even though they have this impaired ability to distinguish sounds, and they don't seem to show the same species typical preferences for courtship song as normally reared females do, they still prefer to hear their mate's song. So in my research, I want to use both normally reared and song naive females to be able to see whether the ability to recognize a mate acoustically is really based on brain circuits that are taking place in areas involved with auditory processing or if it lies elsewhere in the brain and there's something else going on here. Again, I'm really interested in the neural circuits, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is all stuff that's going to take place on the cellular level within the brain. And in order to study this, we built an apartment complex. Okay, not really, but we did have a whole setup where here we're going to have our first floor of an apartment building, for example. And all of these females are going to be raised normally. So these are all females who are raised with exposure to song. And the first two females here are next door neighbors in the apartment building. And unfortunately, the walls here are extremely thin. So everything that's going on in the first female's cage is going to be heard by the second female and vice versa. There's not a lot of privacy here. Next, these last two females, they are living on the complete opposite end of the hallway. So they have never seen the first two birds. They've never heard the first two birds. They might even think that those apartments are vacant. But importantly for my study is that they've never heard these first two birds. Now, I mentioned previously that what I'm looking for is neuronal activation, and in order to look at differences in this, I'm going to be creating different stimulus conditions. So the first stimulus condition is going to be the mate song condition, and this is going to be the red female listening to her own mate song. So this is a song that she's heard a lot because he's going to sing to try and impress her. This is her mate, and so this is something that's really relevant to her. Next, we're going to have familiar song. So this is the green bird hearing the red bird's mate. So again, the walls here are very thin. So the green bird has heard the red bird's mate just as much as the red bird has heard her own mate. The difference here is that the green bird is not mated to this guy. She is just very familiar with his song. Next, we're going to have the stranger song condition. And the stranger song condition is the bluebird here hearing the red bird's mate. And the first time that the bluebird is ever going to hear this song is during this experiment. So she's never heard it before. This is a complete stranger to her. And finally, we're going to have the silence condition. 
And this silent control is really important for my study because it's going to let us have a background level of neural activation that we can base most of our analyses on. So once we have this whole floor set up, what we do is we replicate it just a couple of floors down and everything is the same. The apartment layout is the same. The stimulus conditions are the same. The only difference is that the females in this portion, in this floor, are raised song naive. So they are raised without song. And this is going to let us compare between the normally reared females and the song naive females. So once we have all of our set stimuli set up, then we get to decide where in the brain we're going to look. So this is an image of a zebra finch brain. The front is the right side and the back is the left side. And you can kind of already see just with your eyes that there are certain boundaries here and different regions, and we have to decide where we're going to start. Luckily for me, there's been a lot of previous research that points to this particular area. This is called the caudomedial nidopalium or the NCM, and this is a secondary auditory processing region, and it's very heavily involved in song learning and song recognition. What we see is that, for example, when a male is singing, or when a female is listening to another bird singing, we see a lot of neural activity going on in the NCM. So we really wanted to start here because this seems like a good candidate region and maybe we can see if there's differences between the mate versus a familiar or other conditions that we have. So we take all of our brain slices, we go to the microscope room, we take a lot of images, and I mean a lot of images, and then we get to look at them. So we're going to start with the normal silence condition here. And this is a blank screen, and this kind of makes sense. So we're looking in the NCM, which is an auditory processing region, and we're not actually having any auditory input for the moment. And so you wouldn't expect to see any activity here. So that's great. Then we're going to move on to the stranger song condition. And here we actually start to see some activity. So the red stain that we're seeing here is a stain for PS6, which is the phosphorylated version of the S6 ribosomal protein. And this protein phosphorylates when the neuron is active. So every cell that you're going to see in this bright red, that is a cell that was active during the stimulus playback. And so we see a couple of these in the stranger song condition. In the familiar song condition, we also see a couple of active cells. And finally, in the mate song condition, we see a whole bunch of active cells. And you can think of this as existing on a gradient. So the silence condition, we don't have a lot of activity at all. The mate song condition, we have a whole bunch of activity. And then we have stranger song and familiar song kind of mixed in the middle there. And intuitively, we think this might make sense. So the mate song is a really important song. We know that behaviorally, these birds prefer the mate song. So you can kind of guess that it would make sense that there's a lot of activity in the mate song condition. But now we have to look at the song naive birds. So starting off with the silence condition, we see that this is exactly what we're seeing in the normally breed birds. So they start off with no activity at all. This is great. And then we get to the stranger song condition. And here you can almost immediately tell that there's a big visual difference between how much activity is going on in the song naive birds brains and how much is going on in the normally reared birds brains. And in fact, if we look at all of our other conditions, we see that the pattern that we saw during the normally reared birds uh, stimuli is not being replicated in the, strain, in the song naive birds stimuli. So now we have to quantify all of this and quantification means going through every single image that I took and counting every single cell in every single image. So shout out to my lab mates for helping me with that. But once we have that done, we can build a graph. So on this y axis, we see the average number of PS6 cells, so the average number of active cells, and we've broken down the rest of the graph by rearing and by stimulus. So starting with the normally reared females, what we see is that the normally reared females show the greatest brain activation when they're hearing their mate's song. So the silence condition is a uh, very low activation and the mate song condition is much higher activation. And then you have unfamiliar and familiar kind of in the middle there. And this mirrors what we saw in the images where the silence condition had the least and the mate had the most. 
Now, moving on to the song naive females, what we see is that they actually show the greatest activation in response to an unfamiliar song, whereas the mate condition is kind of middling for them. And this really begs two questions. First, why this difference in activity? And second, if the activity is different, then how come the birds can still recognize their mates? So we talked about how the NCM is involved in song learning and recognition, but we also talked about how the birds will prefer to hear their mate's song. And what we see is that the neural activation patterns that we're looking at, especially in the song naive females, aren't matching the behavior that we're seeing. So we're going to look elsewhere in the brain. And in order to decide where to look, we were thinking of looking at areas that might be connected to the NCM in some way. And in order to find the places that are connected to the NCM, a team used a tracer. And a tracer is basically a dye that you can inject into one part of the brain, and it'll spread along axonal and neuronal connections to other regions of the brain that are connected to the area where you did the injection. So in this case, our tracer is a bright pink, and so any neurons that are connected to the NCM are going to show up as having these bright pink dots in the neuron itself. And so using that, we're able to identify different regions that could have this tracer. Now, this tracer was a retrograde tracer, meaning that it goes against the current of information. So you can think of it as swimming upstream against the electrical impulses. So if the uh, tracer is going this way, then the information is actually flowing this way. And while there were a number of areas that had tracer in it from the NCM, we decided to focus on just this one first. And this area is a region called the VTA. This is a very old region, evolutionarily speaking, so humans also have a VTA. And it's an area that produces a lot of dopamine and it's heavily involved in reward. Additionally, according to previous research, we split the VTA into two areas for analysis, the rostral part and the caudal part. And spoiler alert, we didn't find any significant differences in the rostral part, but I will tell you about the caudal part as we continue now. So we went back to the microscope room, we took a bunch more images, we got those quantified, and now I got another graph. And here we're actually looking at the percent of dopaminergic neurons that are active. And the first thing that you might notice is that there is no difference based on rearing. So the normally reared females in the blue circles and the song naive females in the red squares, they are mixed together. So there's no difference based on whether they're raised with or without song. Next, you might notice this trend that seems to imitate what we saw in the normally reared NCM. And for this, we're seeing that in all birds in this caudal VTA, they're showing greater activity in, upon hearing their mate's song. And this is really interesting because it is mimicking the behavior that we see. So to summarize this whole presentation for you, first, regardless of how they're raised, we see that we see a similar brain activity in the caudal VTA. And this is a parallel to the behavior that we're seeing where, again, regardless of how they're raised with song or without song, we see these birds prefer to listen to their mate. And to me, this is particularly interesting because this is not the pattern that we see in the NCM. So in the NCM, we see two very different patterns of behavior in response to the mate song versus other conditions uh, based on how these birds are raised. However, in the VTA, we see this trend of activity that really mimics the behavior that we see. And on the one hand, this is really cool for me as a scientist to finally have something that looks like it's imitating the behavior, but it also seems to imply that maybe the locus of individual recognition isn't actually in the places where uh, sound or sensory processing is happening, but it might be in other areas of the brain, such as the more reward-focused VTA. However, this comes with a caveat that future research is still needed. So I've talked to you about two different brain regions, but there's still the whole rest of the brain that needs to be looked at, and this is actually the work that I'm currently continuing to do. Additionally, there are also other sensory modalities to investigate. I mentioned in the beginning that zebra finches also have this very distinctive plumage and that this is a visual cue that they can use. So it would be interesting to investigate whether or not these same patterns hold true for 
visual sensory for the visual sensory modality or if it's just the auditory and additionally we can also combine this and create multimodal presentations so if a bird is both seeing and hearing their mate do we see again similar or different patterns of activity in the brain and how does that relate to the behavioral output that we get Finally, while my main interest in this research is because I'm very interested in how animals work and how communication and individual recognition works in the animals themselves, there is also something to be said for the translational impact of how understanding how individual recognition works in birds could actually inform our understanding of human recognition. So there are certain diseases where as the disease progresses, people start to lose the ability to recognize others and even more devastating, they start to lose the ability to recognize their loved ones. And if we understand how individual recognition works on a cellular level, so how do these sensory inputs get taken and what circuits process that into the ability to recognize someone else, this could open up the path for developing therapeutic drugs or other methods of ameliorating these symptoms. So in conclusion, Next time that you're out getting coffee with a friend and you hear some sparrows chirping in the bushes, spare a thought for the complex web of neural activity that's going on that lets them know who they're talking to and who they're chasing around. And on the same token, spare a thought for the complex web of activity that's going on in your own brain that lets you recognize other individuals. With that, I'd like to thank my lab and our funding and all of you for watching. Thank you.